and we are live. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. I'm not sure what time it is where you're at. It's morning here. So I'm drinking my coffee and I'm super excited. We have another amazing set of talks for you today. You got not one, not two, but three talks today. Um, and the first one we're kicking off with Matthew Can from BE Works. Um, it's going to be amazing. Uh, welcome, Matthew. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thanks, Jordan. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Yeah. I'm super excited. I love, uh, I've been loving all the talks that uh, I've been doing with Block Hack and particularly the ones from BE Works. Kelly Peters' talk uh, just over a week ago was so informative. I have I have notes that I've been going over. I've rewatched the video. It's it's super applicable to blockchain, and uh, I'm looking forward to your talk as well. Um, so I know you have a very very deep background in psychology, and um, and you've uh, you've done work across several industries. Well, I want to know, and I love asking people, what was their like aha moment and how they came into the blockchain space? So what was that like for you? Um, admittedly, I'm uh, a bit newer uh, to the blockchain space, um, but um, I've been very intrigued by um, its its application. It's uh, kind of a Hippocratic oath of, of decentralization. I think that's very, very valuable. Uh, and really, I was introduced uh, to more of this blockchain work by Kelly, because I think she's a huge proponent uh, of, of blockchain and its applications. Um, so, um, you know, like beginning in the beginning, I heard about it, heard about, uh, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, but I did a more deeper dive when I was um, given uh, in uh, like a, a research project looking into uh, crypto kitties. So that's a bit more niche, but uh, that was an interesting uh, deep dive that I did. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to be here. Uh, thanks, Jordan, and i um, excited to talk about onboarding. And hopefully we can apply some of these ideas to um, whatever you're developing in the blockchain space. Awesome. That's super exciting. Uh, crypto kitties was like, you know, a... Uh instigator for you know this 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 rush into into ethereum and it was also kind of it's um you know it's downfall to a certain degree or at least we found out what ETH's limitations were at that point in time mm -hmm. so uh talk a little bit more about about like what it was like working with crypto kitties what kind of work did you do there um i think it was more about like um for me, uh, what I did was more about the research, um, just because being brand new, I didn't know what, what they were um, and how they operated. So it was uh, very neat in terms of how um, how I understand how, how it works. Like that actually helped me understand how their decentralization processes uh, worked a bit more. So I didn't go too, too deep into that, but it, it did definitely introduce me to the world of, of blockchain. Awesome. And now I think we're kind of seeing a resurgence of that original, um, the, the original idea, the idea of an NFT, a non fungible token. Um, right. And and so now there's like all kinds of projects digitizing art and um, gaming is a big big piece uh, of that economy. So I think um, particularly behavior economics is going to play a huge role in what motivates people to engage with these. Uh, these new digital assets that that are um, you know unique, but they can mm -hmm. be used. They actually like, have use case if, like, particularly you're a gamer or if you're an art collector. And um, these motivations are very different than um, the typical uh, crypto blockchain motivations, where where a lot of it seems to um, focus around money and monetary value and what can I buy with it. But but these um, you know NFTs are are now are based on in or like val speculative value or like you know subjective value so right. um, I'm super interested in, in hearing what um, what kind of thoughts you have on um, on designing better experience yeah for sure for sure cool 
So for the folks that are tuning in today, we're about to get started, but I would like to quickly draw your attention down to the bottom of the screen. There is an ask a question button there. If at any point in time you have a question for Matthew during his talk, please use the ask a question button. And if you see a question already there, give it an upvote and then we'll make sure that we get to your questions um, towards the end. Um, also look right beside uh, the ask a question button. There are a couple polls that we have up um, for you guys already and there are a couple polls that we have um, hidden that are going to be revealed at crucial points in the presentation so keep an eye there uh, we'll definitely mention when they are open so um, yeah I think that's all I need to mention about that and of course there is the chat um, feel free to let that chat um, know what you're thinking, where you are today, how you're feeling, what time it is there, what you're drinking, whether it's coffee or it's beer. Let us know in the chat. Okay, uh, without further delay, I'd like everybody to welcome Matthew Can. Matthew is a behavioral scientist at B Works. He is, a, he is passionate about applying behavioral economic principles to solving real world challenges. He has worked on numerous projects solving behavioral challenges in various industries, including financial services, information technology, telecommunication, energy, healthcare, transportation, and also blockchain, as we just heard, uh, uh, and much, much more. Matthew holds a PhD and master's in science in social psychology and Queen's University, and his research specialty is within the area of attitudes and persuasion. Matthew has previously served as a lecturer at the Royal University College of Canada, where he taught statistics, psychology, and organizational behavior. I'd like everybody to uh, help me welcome, with a nice digital hand clap, Matthew Can. Thanks, Joe. That's a wonderful, wonderful uh, introduction. Um, yeah, good Good morning, everyone. I see um, John, uh, Juan um, saying hello there. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen, um, and I'm going to be looking up a little bit because that's, that's where my screen uh, is going to be. So give me uh, one second as, uh, as I do that. Okay, so I've shared my screen. Um, can I get a little uh, feedback from maybe Joran? Can you see my screen properly? It's the yellow, that's uh, the orange screen that says with the with the title page. We are good. Yeah, we can totally see it. Okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, hi everyone. Once again, I'm Matt. Um, thanks for being here. I know it's uh, Sunday morning at 11, so um, really appreciate your time. Uh, and so today I'm going to talk about designing a better onboarding experience using behavioral economics. And hopefully you can take some of these ideas uh, at the end of the, this talk and bring it back to some of the things you, that you're developing and implement some of these ideas. Um, so here's a, a little more about myself. Uh, thanks, Jordan, for the wonderful, wonderful introduction. Uh, I just want to talk about some, some more work that I, I've done. Uh, like Jordan said, I, I work uh, at BU Works, and I've, uh, my, main, my main role is to uh, solve real-world challenges, uh, especially behavioral challenges using behavior economics. So I've worked in a number of sectors. And uh, for example, I've helped financial advisors uh, give advice uh, to their customers. So uh, th the customers would uh, receive uh, better advice and they would follow through with that advice. Uh, I've helped customers utilize free services that they're missing out on. So the companies would offer free services uh, to their customers, but they wouldn't use it. And so we've done this for uh, energy companies, we've done this for insurance companies. Uh, I've also worked um, on, on projects where uh, we would reduce um, a certain number, uh, the wait times on, on subway platforms, trying to make that uh, subway commute process a bit more efficient. So a lot more projects uh, like that, along with other adoption, tech adoption uh, projects that we've done. 
So a little bit about our, our company. Uh, we were founded in 2010, uh, and we are uh, the first and leading firm uh, dedicated to the application of bees to commercial challenges. Uh, our co-founders are uh, well-renowned uh, renowned scientists and business, business leaders. And we've had Kelly, uh, our CEO, talk um, last week at this conference uh, and two other notable founders uh, and they're a huge part of this company are professors Dan Ariely and Nina Mazar. So three wonderful, wonderful folks uh, who have uh, built the foundation uh, and continue to build this company. Now we're uh, a team of 50 plus people uh, and most of our employees um, have PhDs in psychology. And so um, I've been told that we are uh, the uh, largest employer, uh, we are the employer with the largest number of uh, PhDs in psychology, uh, I think, in the world. And um, we've actually worked on a number of interesting uh, projects across different sectors and in, sp in terms of specific uh, tech adoption projects. Uh, we've looked at uh, helping uh, financial advisors adopt uh, some AI uh, AI tools to help them give advice. Uh, we've looked at um, getting uh, sales agents to use uh, newly developed apps by uh, by their companies, and we've looked at um, in-home dialysis. So there was a, a company who a, a pharmaceutical company that developed a, a fantastic tool to help people with in-home dialysis uh, for uh, chronic kidney disease patients but they weren't um, using it. So how do we get these people to adopt this new technology? That's fantastic. Um, and so they can use the maximum, they can maximize the use of, of, this, of this technology. And so we're located in Toronto, uh, in Canada, uh, but we can also be found uh, across different uh, con countries in the world, uh, where notably our offices in uh, Bogota and Tokyo. So today, <clears throat> I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. Uh, we're going to uh, learn about uh, foundational theories of behavior economics. So it'll be a, a quick, quick crash course. And then we're gonna apply these behavior economic principles to the onboarding experience. And afterwards, we'll have a Q&A to discuss some of the questions you may have, maybe with particular of what you're trying to do and then how, how the BE lens applies and um, how you can implement some of these ideas. Okay, so uh, here's a quick introduction to BE. If you want to learn a little bit more uh, about BE, you can always refer to Kelly's talk, and I think she had uh, a great introduction uh, to BE along with her insights and how that relates to uh, the blockchain world. Now, if we look back um, at traditional economics, uh, because that's kind of the more the, the the older field of economics compared to behavior economics is actually relatively new. Uh, tradi traditional economics would assume that we are maximizers, so we um, are people that will seek and use information and calculate costs and benefits, uh, so incentives to make us make rational choices. So uh, we are going to be uh, rational. We're, we, we're given um, an incentive will behave in a particular manner. So, um, but we know that that is not always uh, the case. Um, we are um, influenced uh, by the context we're in, the context of this decision uh, when we are making these decisions. So maybe we'll, we can uh, take a look at an example of that. Okay. So here uh, we have um, a study done by our founder, uh, Dan really, and so he generated uh, using uh, computer animation to uh, make these two faces, uh, Tom and Jerry. So these two, you know, relatively uh, good-looking fellas. Uh, and then he asked a bunch of people, uh, "Okay, so if you were to go on a date, who would you go on a date with?" And so about fifty percent of the people said Tom, and uh, fifty percent of the people uh, said Jerry. Okay. So now, uh, what he did next was this. He added in um, someone who kind of looked like Jerry. And so 
uh, I'm going to ask you now, you know, what do you think would happen uh, if this is the case? So between Tom, uh, Jerry, as well as uh, Jerry lookalike, who would these people choose? Um, and in the poll, you're going to be asked, you know, who would you choose? Right. So let's. Uh, so if you're joining, can help me uh, set up that poll right now. People can take a look um, and see who would uh, they choose. Yeah. So the poll is now open. Maybe I can't really see the results. So if you could tell me, that'd be that'd be great. Yeah. Let me see here. Wait for some answers to come in. Well, I personally would choose uh, Jerry, like far right Jerry. And it, yeah, the, the, the answers are showing 100% Jerry, um, not not the lookalike Jerry, not an asterisk Jerry. Okay. Yeah. okay, okay, that's interesting. Okay, all right. So now what happened next was um, our, uh, Dan really got uh, a group of um, other participants and then they showed him this at the bottom. So now instead of... Um, um a similar tom there's going to be and so it's similar jerry then there's a similar tom so it's now it's tom a similar tom as well as a jerry uh and so what do you think people chose mm, oh let me let me make that poll visible to everybody yeah so there's another poll down there guys uh go ahead and vote hmm it's weird because now i kind of like tom <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, yeah. and uh, people had a response uh, opportunity to respond. Let's see here. Uh, yeah. So yeah. obviously these these uh, you know answers may be biased a little bit because I've primed you a little bit, um, but you know um, in in this actual study, you know it's very it, it's the method scientifically sound. Right. Um, so it seems like uh, what people are more interested, who the person is more, what people are more interested in, in is Tom. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, these were exactly those results. So uh, it's interesting because when you just present Tom and Jerry uh, in isolation, right? People fifty percent of the time pick Tom, and uh, or fifty percent of the people pick Tom, and the fifty percent of the people pick Jerry. Now, if you add in uh, a, a similar but you know, not as attractive Jerry, right? People start to like Jerry a bit more because there's this you know direct comparison. Okay. Now, if you flip that and instead of kind of a less attractive Jerry, you put in the left less attractive Tom, right? people start liking Tom. This is what you see at the bottom. So this is really fascinating. Uh, because, like I said in the beginning, there were no differences between Tom and Jerry. But if you add in a third option that's slightly less um, attractive or desirable, uh, one of those options becomes much more attractive. So really, this shows that our context really uh, influences how rational our decisions are. Um, so a little advice for you. So next time when you go to bar with a friend, if we ever are able to do that in uh, this kind of crazy world, you know, you make you want to make sure you're the better looking one. Um, and so um, maybe your chances will be better. Are you suggesting we find someone that looks like us and and make sure that we're just slightly more attractive? Than they are? Well, I'm I'm not suggesting that. I think the science <laughs> the science is suggesting that. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so what this really demonstrates is that we're boundedly rational. Uh, we're boundedly rational people in that our decisions are influenced by, by the context of that decision, by that information that we're given. And we're also boundedly rational because we're limited in our cognitive resources and mental energy. And because we are limited in our cognitive uh, resources and mental energy, we use something called heuristics that are mental shortcuts, uh, which can help us make our life simpler. So instead of you know thinking through every single decision, we, may, we lean on experience, we lean on um, kind of our intuition and just kind of uh, come up with answers. However, these heuristics can make us uh, quite vulnerable uh, to biases. Um, and I think as I want to mention that, yeah, we are uh, way more biased uh, than we believe we are, which is quite interesting. There's a lot of, lot of um, 
psychological principles behind that. But I'm going to show you uh, an example of um, one particular bias, which is the uh, anchoring bias. So let's take a look at an example of this bias. So uh, Kahneman and Tversky or or like um, uh, well-renowned international scientists uh, with Kahneman winning a Nobel Prize in economics. Um, and um, Tversky would have won too, um, but had unfortunately had passed away by that time. Um, Kahneman was rewarded for uh, awarded with um, that award. Um, and so what they did was this. They um, asked people uh, that came into their laboratory, you know, under five seconds, I want you to calculate this, uh, um, this question right here, this mathematical question. So you're basically multiplying uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And they have to do this in uh, five seconds, which means that they're unable to use a calculator uh, to do so. Um, and so I would usually um, try to get the audience to do it and split the room in half. Uh, however, uh, because we're online, it's a little more difficult, but you can try this at home with you know different groups of friends. All right, so now what did people answer when they were given this uh, mathematical question? So the average answer was um, 512. All right, um, and so that's what they, they answered. And for those who are uh, doing the math at home, you know that's incorrect, but that was the average answer. And so they went and found a different group of people and they asked them, this question. This question starts at eight and multiplies all the way down to one. So eight times seven times six times five times four times three times one. And then they ask them the same question uh, in under the same uh, context. So under five seconds, calculate how much uh, you know, what the answer to this mathematical question uh, is. And they would say uh, this on average, 200, uh, sorry, 2250. And so there is this huge discrepancy between the two um, mathematical questions. But if you look at them side by side, you know that they should um, have the exact same answer, right? Uh, and so this is what the anchoring bias is. So we, as people, we depend too heavily on an initial piece of information. So for the people in the first group, they've kind of anchored uh, their mindset uh, in, in the numbers that are smaller. So like one, two, three, and people, in the second uh, row here, uh, in the second group, they've anchored their mindset in 876. So that kind of explains why the uh, answer to the first question is smaller than the answer to the second question. So if you want to try this at home, see if you can get different uh, answers from uh, your friends and family, you can definitely try that. And for those who are curious, uh, this is the actual answer. So people are actually way off, but um, it's, but it's under five seconds, so we'll give them a pass. So now, uh, these biases are, are seen often, and they're large and they're systematic. And so what this has been termed is called uh, predictably irrational. So actually, a title of a book uh, by our, um, our one of our co-founders, Dan Arelli. So if you are interested in kind of uh, jumping uh, into uh, behavior economics, understand how behavior economic works a little bit. Uh, this is one of those books that uh, can give you great insight and kind of opens the door to, uh, for you into behavior economics. And so because we are predictably um, irrational as people when we're making these decisions, uh, we uh, can actually leverage these biases to nudge for better outcomes through something called choice architecture. So really you're, what you're doing here and what we're actually talking about today is that we're designing um, an environment uh, for people uh, so they're more likely to behave in a certain way. Uh, so it's not really uh, um, about you know, forcing them or banning them or they're making uh, banning them from doing something or being paid penalty. Um, it's nudging, and that nudging is a very apt term because you're you know giving them a gentle gentle tap or not even a push, gentle tap towards a particular direction, and people are more likely to behave in that particular manner. So I want what I want you to take from this. Um, uh, I, this 
quick crash course of behavioral economics is that you want to keep in mind when you're designing that your users are boundedly rational and they can be influenced by systematic uh, biases. So really what you want to do um, in general is think about the psychology of, of, um, of your users and you want to put yourself in the perspective of users so you can design a system, uh, design a platform uh, that that best suits uh, their needs and their understanding. And if you're able to do that, you are um, setting up yourself for much greater success. Okay. So now we're gonna switch gears a little bit and we're going to jump into the onboarding experience. And so uh, I want to uh, refer to Kelly's talk a little bit. Um, and so what she talked about was technology adoption. Right, and how that can be broken down into two steps. So first we need to overcome some of the barriers to technology adoption, and then we need to feel it um, with other uh, psychological or behavioral economic principles. So uh, here are the three uh, barriers that she talked about. The first is being perception of risk. Um, and adoption of a new technology can be risky. It can be uh, risky economically. So people pay for a new technology uh, and then they, um, you know, uh, and then it's not functional or it doesn't work great and they waste their money. Uh, it could be a personal risk. So if it's like a health technology, um, they um, kind of maybe uh, insert a, uh, so sort of take a drug or some sort or take some type of treatment and then um, that doesn't work out. So then that doesn't harm. And so uh, there's other risks as well, uh, combined with like social risk as well. So you might look like a fool uh, for adopting technology. So back in the day, we had Google Glasses and uh, people uh, who wore them, there was a, ter there was a um, term for them called glass holes. Um, and so you don't want to be paying like, you know, $1,500 to be called in, in a glass hole, right? Uh, so in order to overcome this risk, we can uh, increase self-efficacy. So getting people to believe that um, they're able to perform an action. So uh, if you're able to increase self-efficacy, you're able to decrease that perception of risk. And you can do this through facilitating a sense of mastery, uh, using baby steps as well as positive feedback. The next bit, uh, barrier is lack of trust. Um, and that's um, really about people not trusting um, a new technology. Maybe it could be uh, uh, things uh, in the nature of uh, security or, or privacy um, or, uh, well, mainly those two. Um, so in order to overcome that, what you might want to do is uh, leverage a, a behavior um, strategy, behavior strategy, bear economic strategy called operational transparency. So this is where our users are showing uh, the hidden processes underlying a service or a product. Uh, and what this does is that it actually increases trust uh, and it actually also increases perceived value. So uh, the example that was given uh, was kayak.com where, where kayak.com, uh, the screens for the loading screens for kayak.com were slowed down uh, and they show them the processes, so like, oh, searching for the best hotels, searching for the, the best deals, best, looking at the uh, different travel agencies. That actually led to uh, higher levels of perceived value uh, compared to just loading screen of nothing. And, and finally, a third uh, barrier is status quo. Uh, and this is uh, where uh, people like the things the way that they are. And um, people are typically um, kind of stuck on, on what, what is the current situation. People like the current situation and people are reluctant to change. And what you could do to overcome that is to uh, leverage habit disruption. So you want to introduce something new when people have a change in habit, or you could leverage a strategy, something called uh, like a fresh start. So if people, uh, hit the age of 65 and they retire, uh, you can introduce a new behavior there because it's a, it's a new frame of mind. Or you can piggyback where you uh, give people instructions to floss your teeth after they brush. Um, so piggybacking the behavior of flossing onto brushing. Now, after you, after you overcome uh, these barriers to technology adoption, what you want to do is you want to feel adoption. 
And one of the ways that we can do this is uh, by leveraging social proof. So um, kind of looking around and getting giving um, people cues about what other people are doing. Uh, so the one interesting study uh, is um, Duncan Watts Music Lab study, where they created an artificial music market and they examined the, the downloads uh, by new users based on previous downloads and ratings. And they found that the uh, typically the most popular ones, the popular songs, uh, got the most downloads. Um, and it's interestingly, you can actually flip these ratings. So the, the first song becomes the worst song and the worst song becomes the first and the best song. Um, and what, when you do that, when the ratings are flipped, people actually, in the beginning, when they're first downloading, they actually follow those ratings. So uh, the newly most rated, uh, the newly new song that's rated the most popular becomes uh, most downloaded. So you can influence other people's behaviors by showing them what other people are doing. So now, once you're able to, like I said, overcome these tech adoption barriers, as well as you feel adoption, uh, now there's interest in your platform and people are going to start uh, engaging in your platform. And so here is your opportunity to demonstrate uh, the value of your platform and to build that relationship between user and platform. And if you're able to build that relationship between your user and platform, that's when you can build uh, positive attitudes uh, on the part of your user towards uh, the platform, and they're more likely uh, to uh, they're more likely to actually engage in platform and actually use it. Now, you want to keep in mind that your ultimate goal here is adoption, but a strong on <clears throat> onboarding process will. Um, will get you there, you know, it'll build a strong, strong foundation to get you to adoption. <clears throat> Excuse me. So looking at the onboarding process, we can actually apply the technology acceptance model, otherwise known as TAM, that was originally de uh, developed by Davis. And so this uh, model, the TAM can guide us uh, to help us show value and build the relationship between uh, the user and the platform. So if we look at um, the end goal here, end um, part of, of this uh, diagram here on the right, you'll see usage behavior, right? And that's really what you want to do. You want people to use your platform. And that is influenced by the intention to use. And the intention to use is influenced by both uh, the perceived usefulness of your platform, as well as the perceived ease of use. And the perceived ease of use also influences the perceived usefulness. Now, the key word here is perceived. So knowing uh, designers, I know you won't uh, make an app that is uh, not useful. You know, if you're going to sign something and spend like hours and hours on it, you're going to try to come up with something that's useful. And it probably is useful. but um, your goal beyond that is to get your users to perceive it as useful. And only when they do perceive it as useful that they will actually use it. And if they don't perceive it to be useful, then they're likely not going to use it. And so how do we make it so that your um, platform is going to be uh, perceived as useful uh, and perceived as easy to use? And and so what I've put out here are um, kind of a two-part strategy uh, in terms of how to accomplish that goal. So the first uh, is here, uh, and this is where I talk about the best practices in onboarding. So I've looked at some best practices and I've looked at uh, some of the psychological principles behind them. And so, um, likely you've maybe seen a lot of these practices uh, before uh, in the apps uh, and in uh, different platforms that you've engaged in. Uh, however, here we show uh, the kind of the, the principles, the psychological principles behind it. Now, you, so that you can actually put uh, a psychological principle behind what you're actually seeing. And then in your design in the future, you can leverage these principles uh, and use these principles as guides to whatever you're developing. 
Now, after looking at these best practices, what I'm going to talk about are, are ways to augment uh, this onboarding process with uh, behavioral-based uh, principles. And uh, so you can implement these uh, BE-based principles in order to um, augment your, your onboarding process. Uh, so to uh, be able to do things like motivate a particular type of action, um, guide their decision, and increase your perceived value. And we'll see that a bit later. Now, um, with, with onboarding here, in terms of best practice, you need to show two things, right? So how to use your app. Okay. And showing how to use your app uh, feeds into showing that your app is useful. And the second part here is to show how easy it is uh, to use your app. And that uh, shows also feeds into how useful your app is. And so how can we do that? Um, one way to do that uh, is to include a tutorial uh, that includes uh, the principles of simplification, salience, and positive reinforcement. So what Simplification and salient does is that it helps users navigate your platform by recognizing us, uh, our our cognitive, our limited cognitive resources uh, that we have as people. So we want to be able to make it easy for them, and we want to help them focus so they get the appropriate information at the appropriate time. Because your platform could have a lot, a lot of information all the time, and um, you might want to you might want to present them all these useful uh, things that, or neat things that your your app, your, your platform does. And so um, we know that people aren't able to digest um, and kind of understand and comprehend all this information at once. So we need to leverage uh, the principles of simplification and salience uh, when making uh, the onboarding process as um, smooth and as effective as possible. Now, the other element is, is positive feedback. So what this does is that it provides people with the confidence to use your platform um, and actually teaches them how to use your platform. And so let's take a look at how this can be done. Um, with simplification, uh, what you could do is a simple initial boarding to help understand, uh, help users understand your value proposition. So Slack does a pretty good job here uh, in, in the series of four screens. Uh, they help users understand the app's basic value proposition. Uh, they keep it simple between um, like under five slides. And uh, so here you, see, you can see uh, that they can quickly show people their value proposition. And one thing to keep in mind is you, if you, you also want to add a uh, skip button so people are more or less likely. Um, so for those people who are more impatient, uh, they can uh, actually just move on and go through. Another way uh, to leverage simplification is to use progressive disclosure to show users how the app works. Uh, really, this is learning uh, by doing, and you want to uh, break it down to simple steps and showing people um, what your app does and how you can do certain things uh, one step uh, at a time. And Duolingo does a pretty good job uh, at this, um, this interaction tutor interactive tutorial where um, people can go through you know, the functions of the app um, in a progressive manner. So now we can move on to uh, salience. Um, so once again, we are limited in our cognitive resources and mental energy, so we, we want uh, when designing, we want users to focus on a particular action at one time. So you want to provide instructions uh, as they appear. Uh, another way to do this is you want to you can uh, use a different visuals to highlight what you want people to look at. So you could use a particular color. You can circle. You can uh, use maybe sound or animation to make it a bit more obvious that this is what you want people to focus on. Another way uh, to use uh, to leverage the principle of salience is to use dynamic onboardings. Uh, and what this is, it's, it's uh, mainly animated onboardings instead of static uh, images. 
uh, when something's animated, it tends to draw people's attention a bit more. Uh, obviously, you don't want to over animate, but for particular parts that you want people to focus on, you want to add in that animation. And what this does, it catches people's attention uh, and they, that gives them a cue to show that, oh, this is what I should be focusing on right now. And finally, you should have uh, positive reinforcement. So uh, positive reinforcement, so such as uh, visual or sound. So this would be like a, gr a green check mark or like a ding, um, like a com for, for completing something. This allows developers to communicate the users are maximizing the usage of the platform. And it provides users with confidence to use the platform. And this also allows for learned uh, behaviors. So I think here is an example of, of um, MailChimp giving high fives. So this uh, positive uh, feedback, positive reinforcement, giving people um, um, feedback in terms of what they're doing right uh, allows uh, you to uh, teach people uh, what you want them to learn. And Duolingo also does this as well. So when when you complete a lesson, they give you um, like a a congratulatory message, uh, they give you like a sound, um, that can actually help people build habits and uh, and that might encourage them to come back and, and re-engage in your, in your platform. So I've actually uh, given Jordan a couple links in terms of the best practices uh, in uh, in onboarding. Uh, so these two are, I, I give him two websites. So if on your free time, you can refer to these two uh, websites. These are, um, I've looked through them. They are concrete um, and uh, they're concrete and actionable strategies that you could easily just um, put into your, um, into your platform in order to leverage these practices when you're trying to onboard people. Now, I'm going to move on to uh, augment, augmented onboarding. Um, so this is where we augment the onboarding process with BE-based techniques. So like I said, you want to include the, the best practices uh, when first designing your, uh, your onboarding process. But after that, on top of that, what you might want to do is implement some BE-based techniques um, in order to to make your onboarding process more effective. So how I've broken down this next section uh, is um, kind of the three uh, outcomes of some of these techniques. So sometimes you might want to increase perceived value of your uh, platform when you're onboarding. Sometimes you want to motivate a particular behavior or action. And some, or sometimes you might just want to guide some of their decisions. And so if uh, some of these outcomes do apply to your, your platform, you can take a look at some of these uh, BA-based principles and techniques, uh, and you can implement those. Now, there are several things to keep in mind when you're actually trying to do that, um, is that your product or service might be idiosyncratic. So what I've shown you here uh, may have worked in other realms, um, outside uh, of tech, um, it might not particularly work for you. Or let's say this, um, a predictive technique worked for one product uh, or service, but it doesn't necessarily mean it might work for you. So um, it's important um, to test. And that's my third point, but I'm going back to my second point, which is where we talk about mix and match. So uh, these uh, techniques are not mutually exclusive. Uh, so you can actually mix and match. So if you have in your onboarding process, you can actually, if you want to both uh, motivate action and guide decisions, you can actually mix and match some of these techniques. Now, uh, keeping in mind your products are uh, could, are idiosyncratic and um, you may want to mix and match the techniques. There's many variables going into what you're actually uh, building and what your final product is going to be. So it is very important to actually test and think about what you're putting out there uh, because we want, you want it to work and you don't want it to uh, backfire uh, what you, whatever you're putting out there. So test, test, test. So let's take a look at the first uh, group of behavioral techniques, which is to increase perceived value. 
And the first B principle is the endowment effect that we're going to talk about. So this is the increased valuation that people have for self-assembled products compared to objectively similar products, which they did not assemble. So more generally, it refers to the fact that the more effort we invest in something, the more we value it. So when we have something, we, we, we buy something, uh, we own something, we have psychological ownership over that. So um, if we both own, let's say iPhones, I'm gonna value my phone more than your iPhone, right? Uh, and you're gonna value your iPhone more than, than my iPhone. Um, and it works for uh, most, uh, most objects and most things. And sometimes uh, this is called uh, the Ikea effect. Um, and so this refers to uh, the process of, of building something. So a neat study that was done uh, by Ariely and colleagues um, is this. So they, they invited uh, two groups of people uh, to come into the lab. And so what they did was that they uh, gave one group of participants uh, pieces for a car with assembly instructions, and then they told them to build it. And so they went ahead and, and built it. And then, um, and then uh, the in the second condition, uh, people were actually just simply given a car uh, that's already assembled, and they were asked to examine it. And then subsequently, uh, so after the first group of people built the car, and the second group of people examined the car, they asked them, "How much would you pay for this product?" Um, and so this is what they found. And they found that people who actually built it were more willing to pay uh, for the product that they built, um, 110% more than the people who simply examined it. So while both groups were offered the same product, the exact same car, um, those who put it together gave it more, more value. Um, so how can you apply this to your onboarding process? You can allow for customization or personalization. Um, so keeping in mind you know, the process of simplification and salience, um, you can also add in um, some type of customization, but you also want to keep it simple. And uh, a platform or an app that actually came to mind when thinking about an example of this was picking my favorite sports teams and sports in a sports app. So previously I had, um, I used the NBC sports app and you can actually pick uh, your favorite team. So uh, in that process, you can um, kind of have some personalization um, and some put some effort into uh, kind of helping uh, the, uh, the optimization of the app uh, so it suits you. And I've also seen this for uh, new users of uh, Netflix as well, uh, if I recall correctly, it's been a while, but you can actually pick some of the movies that uh, you've liked and enjoyed. And so that can actually help build um, kind of this personalization for, uh, for the users. Um, another effect is the uh, decoy effect. And so this is where consumers will tend to have a specific change in preference between two options and when also presented with a third option that is asymmetrically dominated. Okay, so a little, little priming for you there uh, into our next example. Uh, another study um, by Dan Arelli, um are these um, different subscriptions uh, to The Economist. So this is actually quite um, interesting in terms of how uh, he came up with this idea. He actually just noticed uh, these options when he was looking at The Economist and its subscriptions. So as you can see, there are three different options. The, the first is the economist.com uh, subscription, which is uh, just $59. And this is a one-year subscription to The Economist. And uh, the second one is uh, the print subscription, which is uh, $125. So this is just a one-year print edition of The Economist. And finally, you get the print and web subscription, which is the one-year subscription to the print edition and uh, of The Economist and access to uh, the articles online for $125. So uh, if I were to present you with these three options, which one would you choose? 
Um, and so I think Jordan has put up a poll here uh, in order to take a look at some of your answers. Maybe Jordan can let me know um, yeah, if people are answering. Yeah, yeah uh, we got some answers coming in. So far, 100% are saying the $59 one, economist.com subscription. Okay. Oh, we got we, we just got uh, some votes. So now it's 67% uh, economist, uh, uh, $59, and 33% um, the last one, print and web subscription. Okay. That's interesting. Okay. So that was interesting to see. Um, what your answers were. Uh, and so in this particular study, what happened was this. Um, so slightly different um, uh, answers. However, maybe this was done, uh, this was done back before 2008 and possibly there was less internet adoption. And so maybe that's one of the reasons why it's different. However, there is a similarity here, right? So it seems like none of the people chose this print subscription by itself. So in this particular option, 16% um, people chose the uh, economist subscription option and 84% of people show the print and web subscription. Um, so like I said, maybe it's different in terms of the, it was, uh, you know, the times have changed and people are more looking at uh, electronic, just simply electronic uh, rather than paper as well. Uh, but this was the effect at that particular time. And so, Based on this data, uh, the intuition would uh, the data intuition would tell us to remove the unpopular option, right? So, what's the point of leaving the print subscription in there if nobody's going to choose this option? And so, what we find uh, is that when the middle option of just simply the print subscription is removed, then the numbers change. So the economist.com subscription changes from 16% to 68%, uh, and the print and web subscription change from 84 to 32%. So what this particular study showed that was that even removing an option that nobody, nobody wanted, uh, that actually led to a 30% decrease in revenue. So because the subscription rates have changed, we can look at the numbers. So in the first option, there were about $114,000 worth of revenue. And in the new offer, there's only about $80,000 worth of revenue. Um, so this is called um, the decoy effect uh, in that the print subscription was a decoy for the print and web subscription because it made the print and web subscription more attractive. Uh, if it sounds familiar to you, uh, it's because we already looked at this effect earlier with Tom and Jerry. Um, and if, right, if you have an uglier Jerry, Jerry looks a lot more attractive. And if you have an uglier Tom, Tom looks a lot more attractive. So how can you implement this? So if you have um, an a uh, situation where you're presenting options for subscription, uh, what you can do is you can include a similar option uh, to the desired option that you want, uh, but the similar option is less desirable. Now, moving on from increasing um, perceived value, uh, we can actually uh, motivate action a number of ways with behavioral economic principles. Uh, so one uh, technique is to use uh, loss aversion, uh, which is where messages framed in the in terms of potential losses are more motivating than messages framed in potential gains. And let's see how uh, this actually works. So in a study looking at uh, credit cards and uh, letters about credit cards, people uh, were sent uh, letters about uh, these credit cards and their usage. And so one letter was uh, framed in a loss manner. So on the left, you see it's the cost of not using the card. So this would be descriptions including charged for uh, cash withdrawals, not protected from theft, and no free credit from for the month, uh, no continuous tracking of expenses. Now on the right side, you see um, a letter uh, that includes gains or benefits of using the card. So you can save money, you can be protected, uh, use free credit, there's uh, continuous tracking. Uh, so essentially, 
this is these two letters are saying the same thing. So the cost of not using the card is the same as the benefits of using the card. And so how do these fare in terms of actual usage of the card? It turns out uh, the loss frame letter was more effective in getting people to use the card. Uh, as you can see, it's at 45.5% of using the card, $270, uh, 66% of message recall as opposed to 29.3% using the card, $129 charged to the card, and as well as 43% of the message recalled. Um, so if you want, uh, when you if you want people to take a particular action in your onboarding process, you might want to include uh, negatively framed messages to leverage uh, loss aversion. So something would be something like that would be don't miss out on these cool features. Or you can use uh, the scarcity effect with a limited time. And I'm sure you've seen this uh, when uh, you're, you're making purchases. I know just Prime Day just went by and it's um, they only had two days and people are going to uh, buy a lot of stuff within two days, but people seem to buy more by the end uh, because it's that limited effect, limited scarcity. So, you can tell people to claim your reward in the next uh, 59 minutes or so and give them that timer. Another way to uh, motivate behavior, uh, motivate action, is through a technique called illusion of progress. So people typically expend more effort as they approach a reward, typically speeding up as they get closer they get. And so even perceived progress towards a goal motivates increased effort of, in pursuing it. So let me show you this example of how this is done. So here are two coffee cards. And um, we've, we've seen this um, with McDonald's and um, I think other apps as well. I know Starbucks has, um, has their own app. But what we see here are two loyalty cards. On the left, uh, you see a loyalty card that simply just says, buy 10 coffees and you get one free. Now on the right side, you see a similar loyalty card, but there are some, some differences here. So instead of buying simply buying 10 coffees and getting one free, here you buy 12 coffees and you get one free. However, these people get two stamps for free. Now effectively, both of these, uh, both of these conditions require 10 purchases to get a free coffee. So if it's both 10, shouldn't they actually um, have the same effectiveness and people would take the same time in terms of buying these 10 coffees. Uh, but it turns out it's not really the case. It turns out that people on the left side where they simply buy 10 coffees and get one for free, it took them an average time of 29 days to complete and buy those 10 coffees. People on the right side, that took them 24 days. And this is where people got um, the card where they were asked to buy 12 coffees, but they got two for free. So creating this perceived head start led people to fill up their loyalty cards faster. And this is what the illusion of progress is. So getting people the sense that they've already completed a couple steps, that can motivate a lot of behavior. And so how can you implement this into your onboarding process? So we've seen a lot of progress bars in tutorials, we, um, the number of steps. And so what you could do is you could actually complete um, a couple steps as they already begin. Uh, so you can say, oh, you've already done the first step already. You've already downloaded the app. Uh, the second step, you've already signed up. And then so uh, they're more likely to complete the rest of the tutorial uh, by uh, completing the rest of the steps. But they have this feeling that they've already made some progress by you know, downloading the app or platform or already signing up. Next, we have uh, guiding decisions. And we can leverage a principle called extremist aversion. And this is the tendency to, uh, for choice makers to avoid extreme options and choose an intermediate option. So studies have, done, uh, look, uh, have been done looking at different sizes. And we, as people typically, and in, in general, uh, people might have different preferences, but in general, by and large, people pick the middle option. So if we look at these three sizes of coffee cups, people typically um, pick this. Pick it small, medium, large. The people pick the medium. But what if you change the sizes like this? 
So now you still have in this set of three, small, medium, large, but compared to previously, the, the small, the medium is now small, the large is now medium, and you add a new larger cup that's large. And what happens here? People pick the middle cup once again. By and large, most people pick middle cup. Some people pick small, some people pick large. So it seems that we, in general, um, are avoidant of these extreme options. So the ones on the edge, we're more likely to pick things in the middle. So you can actually set up um, and present uh, these choices to people. Uh, if you have a number of options that you want to present and get people to pick, you can uh, put the desirable one in the middle. And that's how you do it. And an interesting application, interesting twist of this is this is what you can do. So let's say you have three options, small, medium, large for the coffees, and people genuinely pick small, pick, sorry, pick medium. And so what you want to do is maybe you want to uh, get people to buy the large more. And so how can you do that? One simple way to do that is, is to include a fourth option, an extra large. Now, the large no longer seems as extreme because the extra large is now the extreme one. So now people who look at these four options may be more likely to buy the large as opposed to the last option where there's only three options and people were more likely um, to stick with the middle with the medium. Now, last but not least, we have social norms um, and descriptive norms, a, a type of social norms uh, is what most other people's, most others do. And that can inform us of what actions that we should take as people. And so there was very neat study done by um, Cialdini and colleagues in um, this parking garage. So they went to this parking garage, they either clean it up at one point in time and let people walk by and, and observe their litter behavior, littering behavior. Uh, and at another time, what they did was they dirtied up the environment, they threw trash um, different, like everywhere, uh, and they, get, they got people uh, to walk by, so they, these were people not even part of the study. So they just observed them walking by and observed their littering behavior. So what the clean environment does, it, it tells people, this is a clean environment. We don't litter here. And what the dirty environment tell, does is that it shows people that this is a dirty environment. It's OK to litter here. And so what happened was that when the garage was clean, the parking garage was clean, only 14% of the people littered. However, when the guard was dirtied up, more than double of these people littered. So 32% of these people littered. And so how can we uh, include this into the onboarding process? So just really showing what other people are doing can actually inform what the user's supposed to do or what it was it should do um, and what's socially accepted. So you can easily just show uh, the number of p other people who are using your platform. So for example, I know uh, Tal does this. So it says, oh, like, uh, you know, several thousand people are also in your area using this, uh, using this platform. You're using these tiles right here. So there's, in this example, a screenshot, there's like uh, 1,800 people uh, using tiles around you. Now, one more th cool thing about social norms is that what it also does is that actually increases perceived value. It tells you that other people are using it. So other people perceive the value in using it. And so that gives you a sense of what the value actually is when uh, you're using it. Now, just a quick recap uh, of, of some of the points we've talked about here. So first of all, when designing, you want to keep in mind that people are bound to the irrational and prone to biases. So we want to keep that in mind when we're designing uh, any, any tech. Uh, second of all, uh, you want to uh, show proposi value proposi proposition and you want to build a relationship between the user and the platform when onboarding because you want to build that strong foundation. Um, it's really your, really your first impression uh, that you have when it's onboarding. In terms of best practices, we want to uh, leverage the principles of simplification, salience, and positive reinforcement uh, in your tutorials. And beyond uh, these best practices, you might want to augment your uh, onboarding, onboarding processes with BE tactics 
uh, and that's shown above to um, guide uh, behaviors, increase perceived value, uh, and to uh, motivate action. And finally, once you design your product, you have to ensure that you test because you want to make sure it's effective and it's actually getting um, you to where you want to be in terms of effectiveness of your onboarding process. And hopefully that can lead uh, to adoption of your, your product or service. So thank you everyone for, for listening. Hopefully um, that you can take some of these elements from this talk to think about how you design your product uh, and service. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. So thank you. Oh my goodness. That was amazing. Uh, I'm blown away by, by that, per, that presentation. Um, I knew it was gonna be a good one. Oh, there I am. I knew it was going to be a good one. Um, Kelly Peters gave us a nice, great primer to BE um, just last week, and that like went even further on how to actually implement some of these things in our products. And I'm blown away. I need I've made some notes, but I definitely need to rewatch this. Uh, the decoy effect blew my mind. Uh, framing framing um, loss like. I, I wanted to ask a question specifically about that one because I, I noticed mm -hmm. that you had statistics on um, how much was actually charged to the mm -hmm. card. Um, and I think there's another question in the in the ask a question button, but like, are there links to these studies so that we can look more into it? And specifically about that study, um, like how long was the time frame that they saw, like how mm -hmm. much was charged on the card? Um, so yeah, these are great questions. So like a lot of these, um, well, all of these studies uh, are scientific studies published peer reviewed. Um, so they're on Google Scholar. Um, so um, after this talk, I can give you all of the resources and, and the links. And so you can, if you're interested, you can definitely post them. Uh, in, in terms of the second part of your, um, your question, from my understanding was that it was that people were given this letter um, and then over, I think it was a month uh, or, or so of time, they, measured their credit card usage. So um, so it's basically same condition. So for both groups, the only difference was the letter that they were given and how it was framed, right? The content of the message is still the same, uh, which is quite amazing. And you, if you get a slight tweak in these effects, so you know, don't miss out on the, these benefits uh, as opposed to maximize these benefits, like a small change like that could potentially be quite impactful. And, but once again, you know, this credit card study, you can see these numbers uh, and it's quite interesting. However, if you want to apply to your your uh, your platform, uh, whatever you're developing, you also want to test. So these are these this especially loss of version. It's, it's a tried and true um, uh, beyond BE principle that we've used over and over again. Um, but once again, you still want to test to make sure that's working for you. Yeah. That's that's so amazing. Yeah, I, I definitely want to look at um, these studies a little bit more. I'm a huge stats nerd, so um, that's going to be really cool to look at. And like, there's something so interesting about our psychology. I think in general we've become very skeptical people. So when we we hear like, oh, you're gonna get this, you're gonna gain this, we instantly are like, okay, but but what do I gotta give for that? But when you right. when you frame it as like oh you're gonna lose this like I don't want to lose anything like exactly I, like, <laughs> like it it makes so much sense when you think about it that way but when we see it in in the mm -hmm. real world we just like we're triggered by it and it's something mm -hmm. subconscious that happens it's it's amazing um, right. yeah thank you so much Matthew I have a, there are a couple questions here from our audience and I definitely have more questions I can ask you but I won't yeah, monopolize sure. the time let's see what we have. <laughs> we have here um so there's a um, yeah so yeah there was a question about the the statistical variance on one of the um the studies there but yeah you you already mentioned you're gonna pass us the links to the studies that we talked about and i will make mm -hmm. sure to forward it to our our community i'll link it here in the chat and um i'll put it in our discord for mm -hmm. folks to find afterwards so um, absolutely look out, yeah, stay tuned for that for anyone that wants to see these studies um, and what do we have here? Uh, behaviors. Ah, okay. So, um, are these studies country specific, um, mm -hmm. or are they human specific? So this person, um, is asking like, 
the the difference between like something that might be effective in Japan versus uh, the U.S. Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, I think that's a fantastic question. Um, so, so some of the more um, okay, let me backtrack a bit. Some of so uh, there are definitely cross cultural differences. Uh, there's a huge field of psychology that talks about cross-cultural differences. Uh, they mainly compare uh, individualistic cultures. So these would be cultures that are more so uh, North American and Western European compared to cultures that are more collectivistic. And this would be um, more so East Asian cultures. So it seems like the by and large, most of the studies look at uh, these two comparisons. So um, people who are more individualistic individualistic minded, their mindset is that, you know, they are their own uh, um, entity and and people around them are related to them, but less so compared to collectivistic cultures. So people who are in individualist cultures more likely to say I, uh, people who in collectivistic cultures are more likely to say a we. And so in individualist cultures here, like North America, we have, um, self-esteem and that's really important to a concept to us and um for more collectivistic cultures uh they have something also called collective self-esteem so uh, so the well it's collective self-esteem but so it's like the self-esteem of of the group so there are many differences in, in collectivistic um and individualistic cultures but keep in mind it's just not one or the other it's a continuum so some cultures are more individualistic and some people some cultures are more collectivistic now uh that being said um a lot of these principles that i've um provided um like what from what i recall the um the population uh, of these studies uh, are from um, in more so individualistic cultures. So um, a lot of these studies are done in North America. So a lot of some of the studies are done in um, Western Europe. Uh, that being said, uh, there, I don't believe there is any psychological reasoning uh, where this would not work in more so collectivistic cultures, especially the ones that I've presented. Uh, also, there may have actually is actually quite likely that people have done replications uh, with different populations and that would show like, oh, people who are in Japan who are more collectivistic, um, these um, principles like loss aversion would also uh, work for them. So I, I'm pretty sure like it works for them as well. And if there's um, like, like maybe there isn't, I'm guessing there is a study that looks at loss aversion, um, like I'm like 99.9% .9 sure. Uh, there's at least one. I'm guessing there's like multiple because lo lost version is something that's widely, widely studied. That's, so hopefully that answered that question. Yeah, no, that uh, that was like info packed answer. It made it got the gears turning in my head, um, especially like in in the blockchain space. Uh, you know, we're a decentralized global kind of of network, mm -hmm. but we're still. Um, speaking to people in particular jurisdictions. So we need to cater our messages to mm -hmm. our target audiences. So the way we might target someone in Japan might be a little bit different yeah. uh, than we would target someone in the States. And so yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so go, yeah, that's like, that's really good. So like, the thing that I do want to bring up is that like even, so across different cultures, people's perception, like literally like field of view is different. So um, for collective, so, studies have been shown where people are showing this picture of um like a rudimentary of of a person a hunter in the uh, in in the foreground and then some animals in the background so people from the individualistic cultures would focus on the hunter in the in the foreground uh people from collectivistic cultures would would um look at the bigger picture the view outside so they would see the animals in the background that are being hunted as well so these are done with like eye tracking devices a uh, so a, a very neat study that was also done uh was where uh people from different cultures were asked to actually draw a picture of um a woman or a person and this person was further away so typically people who are individualistic cultures they draw um the face and kind of this like upper chest area. So what you basically see on the screen here. Um, and so people from collectivist cultures, they're more so um, they're more so focused on the bigger perspective, the like the wider vision, a uh, field of vision. And so they actually incorporate, you know, the way they're sitting um, as well. So less so much focus on the face. Um, so if you look at 
um, yeah, maybe different art cuts and cultures, you can kind of see these differences as well. So they've also done analysis on art and, and across different cultures. That's, this is so fascinating. This, I, I feel like we could, I could talk about this literally all day. Um, and there's tons more of study to, to do. Um, like it also, it also like makes me think like, um, the motivation behind something like you can still use these same tactics, but like, say, say in a individualistic society, the loss would be what I'm going to lose what that person is going to lose. But in a more collective society, you mean, what is what is the environment going to lose? What is our community going to lose? And so we can use these tactics to, to specifically target the yeah. person Absol we're talking to. Absolutely. Jordan, you just nailed in the head. That was, that was perfect. That was perfect. Exactly. Exactly how you apply these ideas, right? Um, and that was, that was, yeah, perfect. That was a really good example. Amazing. Okay. There's another question from the audience here. Um, to do any patterns, are there any patterns you've noticed, um, in a lot of FinTech apps or programs that fail and, mm -hmm. uh, and that BE can, can better design? Um, I think, I think it goes back to like a general thing would be, um, I think we have to go back to, to the model that I was talking about. I think people don't recognize the technology, um, but, but they do recognize, but the, uh, people do recognize the technology adoption model, uh, acceptance model, the TAM. But I don't think it, pe uh, that's really kept in mind when it, people are designing. So people actually, um, uh, these these apps are, are 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 great, right? Like they're they have a lot of functionality, but once again, there could be a bunch of barriers to actually adopting uh, these apps. Um, could uh, and these could be addressed by those best practices I've talked about. So there's often a lot of information, uh, a lot of benefits of an app, but we don't want to present it all at one time. We want to like focus on this particular function, uh, give people piecemeal by piecemeal, and help them build that knowledge all together. Um, so, um, I think also another part of that is is adoption, right? I think um, I think if you go back to Kelly's talk, she talked about a lack of trust, especially fintech. Like anything with fintech, it's like it's money. Like especially with money, people are scared uh, or to to lose money, uh, there, there's like higher risk, like an economic, economical risk. So how can we, uh, the key question is how do we overcome uh, that perceived risk? And one of the ways to do it is to um, look at operational, like, uh, sorry, look at self-efficacy, getting people uh, to be more confident in what they're able to do. And also lack of trust, like privacy, security. Um, if you're able to, if you're a, um, a program that actually can able to gain trust of the users, uh, the more people are going to be able, uh, more people are going to be willing to use it. Mm. Very, very interesting. Yeah, I think there is a lot of talk, in, specifically in the blockchain space, on the risks of getting involved in cryptocurrency. But I think there's, you know, a lesser talked about um, risk in not getting involved in cryptocurrencies. You know, the uh, not to fuel the FOMO, but there, that you'll miss out if you don't have a little bit of crypto now and and it does explode uh you know you'll have missed there's, out so there, there there's is loss a aversion. yeah exactly yeah. yeah leveraging again there you go like, uh, <laughs> kind of planted seeds in your mind and now like you're you're applying these behavioral like, principles that's it man i'm i'm super turned on by all of this um <laughs> that's great that's great there's another um thing i wanted to to go back to like earlier on in your talk you mentioned um how kayak um, slowed down the loading times and that increased uh, the perceived mm -hmm. value yeah. and i think um for for many years there's been a lot of talk specifically about you know transaction speed bitcoin being very slow ethereum mm -hmm. you know having its limitations based on what we saw with crypto kitties and i think mm -hmm. we all we want we want faster transactions mm -hmm. do you think there's there that that same, same principle is at play a little bit with kayak like if we had just like super fast instantaneous transactions would mm -hmm. that depreciate the value uh the perceived value of cryptocurrency um well i think you have to look that's that's a very good question so i think we have to look at it from kind of from two perspectives right so 
if something is really slow, right, then the perceived usefulness goes down, right? We, once again, we go back to the the TAN model. Or if your if your perceived usefulness goes down, people are not going to use it, right? So it has to be, you know, fast enough, right? It has to be fast enough. Now, um, but if it's um, to um, but leveraging the op uh, operational transparency idea, right? What you want to do is you actually, instead of being like the fastest possible, you can actually slow things down a little bit, but also show your users what's happening, right? So you can kind of, you know, even if your program maybe it's not that fast, that's okay, as long as you show what you're use what you're doing, right? So instead of like, I, I don't know if you experienced this, maybe you have, I'm guessing a lot of people have. So a loading screen, right? If you're looking at a loading screen, just a circular loading screen with, you know, you don't know how much time it's gonna be, it's just going circular, circle, circle. Um, that is kind of, there's a lot of uncertainty of that. I don't know what's going on, right? But if it's a loading screen where uh, it's like a green bar and you're going, you're, you're, you know, you know you're know you halfway there, you're giving a percentage, you know you're like 50% there, you know like what's, what's happening, what's working. That's um, that gives me more psychological certainty of what's happening, right? Um, so that gives me more like trust, and and I see more value in what the program is actually doing, right? So um, I think I so I don't think it's about all being like about like super fast or super slow. It's it's an optimization and also showing what's going on behind the scenes but at the same time, not overwhelming people with information. So there's a lot of different variables that you want to come in, come build in, build together. And this is why we always stress, please test. Test yeah. your idea because um, so many variables go into play. And if you're unable to, um, and if you put in a, a certain combination, uh, it may work, might not work. So you have to test to, to know for sure. That is amazing. Yeah, yeah. it's a very, very delicate balance. Um, yeah. to uh, to always keep in mind with all of these things. Um, yeah. I know we're getting, uh, yeah. we're, we're, we're going a bit I think I have long. to really go soon. So maybe yeah. that's like, yeah, okay. we will cut it off here. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, we won't get to the last question, but that's all right. We will, um, we'll have tons of information. Uh, Matthew will share with us um, to dig into later. And that uh, that leaves it open also for Matthew to come back and give us another amazing talk. Um, I would love to have you again. This was illuminating. Um, we, I learned so much. I definitely need to rewatch this one, um, as well as the, the one from Kelly um, just about a week ago. But I'd like to thank you very much for your time today. Let's take a quick look at the, at the poll before we sign off. Tons of folks said, uh, said Jerry the first one, Tom the second one, just like we expected. No, no answers for the middle print subscription. And um, tons of folks said that they saw Kelly Kelly's uh, talk last week, and um, lots of people learning about behavioral economics. Um, mm. So that is great to see. Uh, it 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 starts here for a lot of folks, and it, it continues for a long time afterwards. And we're we're aiming to build um, businesses in this space, and we're going to need to use these tactics to communicate our value propositions and onboard people efficiently. So again, thank you so much, Matthew, for an amazing talk. Um, I, was, I was super excited about it. And um, for those of you that are tuning in, we have a, a, a few, we have two more talks later on today. So I'd like to um, bid you farewell and I will see you in the next workshop. Take care, everybody. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. See you, Matthew. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.